Hey! Hi everyone, Adam here with Worldwide Stereo. All right, let's wait for some people to jump on. How we doing, how we doing? So this is gonna be um, our first live video ever that we've done. Um, it's gonna be a, you know, an instructional kind of uh, video workshop. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, TVs and surround sound and settings and all these kind of different things that you can get into. Uh, so first we're just going to wait a little while here, wait for some people to join in. I see a lot of people are joining on already. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for, for watching and joining. Where's, uh, where's everybody from? Where's everybody at? What are you guys doing today? I see Noah's out there. Hey Noah, how are you? Ira, welcome. Thank you. This is awesome. Look at you guys all coming in. This is uh, obviously we're all working from home, so welcome to my home. This is my family room. Um, that's where I do uh, all of my music listening and TV watching and everything. Who else is that? Is that? Dominic, how are you? Good to see you guys. See everybody's joining in here. This is looking great. Indy, wow. All the way from Indy, that's great. Andrew, what's up? Tommy, yo, good to see you guys. This is gonna be great. Um, so, kind of again, the basis for this video is gonna be, I wanna talk about TVs and some just kind of basic guidelines for setting your TV up. Uh, there's some default settings out of the box that we can go over that sometimes aren't the best. And then uh, kind of the evolution of sound and surround sound, what you can do to really enhance your experience and enhance your TV. Uh, anywhere, like I said, from settings to adding audio to it, you know, all the sound bars and surround sound systems out there, um, and just, you know, all the different options. And this is very, very interactive, so please, questions, keep them coming. What I'm going to try and do is I have some segments that I'm going to break this kind of video down into, or this uh, workshop into, and at the end of each segment, I'm going to try and answer as many questions as I can. I have the support, the great support of my marketing team. I got Amanda, I got Emily out there. Uh, Peter, you guys are all helping me out. I have my uh, iPad over here. She's going to send me and take all your questions and send them to me so I can kind of answer them for you um, as we go through this. Um, in the words of our, if I can use a, a, a word from our owner, Bob Cole, who is a uh, sailor, uh, this is the maiden voyage of our Facebook Live events here. So uh, please bear with me. I'm going to do my best. This is, I love doing this kind of stuff. It's a lot of fun. This is definitely our first one. So I'm sure there might be some bumps here or something like that. We're going to work through them and uh, hopefully do more of them. So if you have suggestions and comments um, at the end of this video, you can send us direct messages. Let us know what you thought, um, any topics that you want us to do in the future, and, uh, and we can go from there. So, wow, we got a lot of people on already. This is fantastic. I'm going to get started here. And uh, first thing, you know, I want to talk to you about is TVs. So um, behind me, this is a Samsung 75-inch Q90. Nice big uh, TV for my family room here. I like it a lot. Um, but there are some default settings that uh, aren't so good, I think, when you, when you buy a TV. So I want to focus on that. And the big one out there that a lot of people like to mention and talk about, a little uh, good talking point, is motion flow. Now, everybody calls this something different. Uh, Samsung, LG, and Sony, they all do different terminology for this. The Samsung, they call this setting Auto Motion Plus. Um, LG, they call it True Motion, and Sony calls it Motion Flow. And, and a lot of people, like I said, also have heard it called the soap opera effect. Now, TVs generally have some issues with motion, and these technologies were made to and help smooth things out. But why is it called the soap opera effect? Well, our eyes, when we're watching TV, are used to seeing 24 frames per second. That's just what we've always seen. That's what movies are shot in. That's what, you know, what growing up watching TV, that's the, the rate of motion that we're used to seeing out of these things. And now that these TVs have higher refresh rates, um, it can sometimes make the motion look different. And they call it the soap opera effect because when they, used, when they filmed soap operas, they didn't have, because of the daily occurrence of the, of the show, they didn't use the 24 frames per second film that was out there. So they were using 60 frames per second in their, in their cameras and it just looks weird. And it's unsettling because it's not what we're used to seeing. So for the most part, this is a setting that default comes on with all TVs. So instantly I would recommend shutting it off. 
Now there is one good use for it that I find, and that's for sports. Uh, you can control, not the judder control, or the, but that's called the blur control. And I wanna show that to you in my TV right here. So again, I'm gonna grab my remote, I'm gonna turn over here, and let me go into the settings icon. Now Samsung puts a lot of these quick, easy settings to access right up here for you to, to look at. And I'm gonna slide over to where it says Auto Motion Plus. Now you see I have it off. But what I'm able to do is there's a custom mode. All right, so let me dive into that. I can hit up, and that'll get me into the Auto Motion Plus settings, okay? Here's my custom mode, blur reduction and judder. And I really like to have the blur on for, for motion, okay? When I'm watching football, hockey, things like that, fast moving, it makes the image look really smooth across the screen. But when I'm watching regular TV, and this is what I recommend, regular TV, uh, your drama shows, your American Idols, your... Uh, Netflix watching and all that and definitely movies okay movies I would highly recommend that you shut that feature off again it just makes the camera move it look unnatural and you can actually notice that if you uh, if you're sensitive to uh, motion sickness that kind of thing being on a boat and rocking around that kind of stuff you'll actually feel that because I know I do I feel it when I see that so it's uh, a little unsettling all right, so let me get back out of here so that's that setting to so definitely you want to address that uh, if your TV has a custom mode that you're able to toggle on and off like that, always good to have something set aside um, as a custom mode for when you're watching different different events. But highly turn it off again for sports, or I'm sorry, keep it on for sports, turn it off for movies and, and regular TV watching. Next, um, your picture settings. Um, your picture settings out of the, out of the box on a TV um, are pretty much set to what's called dynamic. All right, dynamic mode is max brightness, max color, and it's just, everything's pegged, um, which can make things look artificial, uh, bleed through of colors. It just, again, doesn't look natural. So the first thing I would recommend you do is when you go into your TV, and again, let me go to the settings menu here, and I'm in picture settings, and in these expert settings right here, oops, I'm sorry, one back, I apologize, picture mode. <laughs> Uh, in picture mode, I'm going to put it to dynamic. And do you see what that did to the picture there? You can actually see that with the logo that I have back there. It really, really made a, uh, made a big bloom. Uh, Mark, can we post questions? Absolutely, Mark. You can post questions whenever you like. Um, I'm going to get to those kind of towards at the end of each little segment. So if you're just joining, um, going through some TV settings that are kind of recommended, please post your questions out there when I'm kind of done talking about TVs and before I move on to something else. I'm gonna take a look at my questions and I'll get those answered for you. So here's that dynamic mode. Dynamic mode, you can see it's very, very strong versus something more calmed down and natural. But the first thing you wanna do is you wanna to go to movie mode, all right? Movie mode is a great place to start because it shuts off a lot of those extra processors like I talked about, like the motion, and but it will be darker, all right? So keep in mind, when you go from dynamic down to the movie mode, your image is gonna appear darker. And I realize I don't even like that, not most people don't either. So then from that point, you can then increase your backlight if you have an OLED or your overall brightness control or your backlight control, excuse me, to increase the overall brightness of the screen. Now your brightness control on there actually controls the kind of the intensity of the black. The, the more you bring down the brightness setting, um, you'll notice your screen will get darker, but you're gonna lose a lot of detail in some shadow areas. So, but again, starting with that movie mode is a great place. It's a, it's a great place to start from. It puts you in a good position to get a nice image on your TV. So those are some of the things that, you know, are, are common settings, common default settings that are built into these TVs that we always change on our showrooms for you. We set all of our TVs up as, to make them look as best as they absolutely can. Um, so it's something important. Now, and again, the motion flow setting, depending on your TV, I would recommend you turn that off because uh, it just it's not a natural movement, and that's why it's called the soap opera effect because it looks like soap opera is used to when they shot them in 60 frames per second versus what's called 24 frames per second, which is what we're used to seeing. Okay, what do we got here? Cinema mode on Sony. Yeah, that, that exactly, Robert. That, that too, that can have an effect on the overall you know, motion of things and how things move around the screen. So, awesome, I'd still recommend starting by giving them a call. Oh, okay, I guess some people are, so you're <laughs> they're responding to me. Fantastic. Um, so that's kind of my wrap up on, on TVs and settings for TVs. 
Um, if Amanda can get me some of these questions that you had been asking here, I'm looking over here to see if any can come through and we can start talking about that. What, uh, I mean, we're all working from home right now. So again, happy to have you here. Um, is there any, you know, please recommend, we need some more movies and TV shows. What's everybody been listening to? Um, let us know. Uh, we can get back to you there. So, uh, again, if you're just joining, I just wrapped up. I kind of talked about all the different uh, settings on TVs that can kind of um, be default settings that aren't so good. Again, the motion settings and some color adjustments. Uh, those are things that you want to handle right away. Don't leave them in those default settings. You can really maximize your TV's performance that way. Okay, so next I kind of want to talk about your sound options and what kind of happened here. So, yeah, I thank you Amanda, I see we haven't had any too many big questions yet, but again, any questions you have, please put them in the comment field. I'm going to stop at the end of each little segment here and uh, go through those and answer those for you. <laughs> Vince says, watching ER on Hulu, great binge watching TV. <laughs> That was a great show. Can you talk about subwoofer settings and placement? I certainly can. We'll get into that when we talk about these uh, uh, sound settings, absolutely. Okay, so TV sound. If you kind of think back to some of the older TVs, they were massive, massive boxes. And below them, they essentially had a car stereo system built into them with like six and a half inch drivers and coaxial tweeters and sometimes even subwoofers. So for most people, the sound was adequate. But flat panels came out, you know, and then we finally were able to hang TVs on the wall, make them really, really thin. And they started out by having some speakers on the side because there was a, a good, you know, nice bezel around them. Well, as things got thinner, people really liked them and liked it getting thinner and smaller. So that sold. So we started seeing TVs with less and less and less of a bezel. So what had to suffer was the audio. There's really nowhere to put the audio on these TVs anymore. So they flew to the back or on the bottom. And most of these speakers now are about the size of, you know, little dimes. You know, not much to them, not much power. So that's why it suffered. And the whole category of a soundbar even exists today is to supplement the TV sound because it's really not that good anymore. So the soundbar category was born. And there's different soundbars out there. You can um, get soundbars that are just meant to be stereo speaker replacements. And when I say stereo, I mean two speakers and a subwoofer, like a left and a right speaker inside of the soundbar, and then you have a subwoofer off to the side as well. So that just hooks simply up to the TV. It's better sound than what the TV has to offer, and it's a good option. You can hook these things up with fiber optic cables. You can hook them up with HDMI cables. Um, and that is, again, better sound than what the TV has to offer. But what's the next step after that? The next step after that is gonna be a soundbar that offers surround sound to it. So you have some sub some soundbars, excuse me, where you can add wireless rears to it. Uh, company JBL actually has a couple of these things that are really cool, Bose does it as well. Uh, but the JBL, so that they make a soundbar, and then there's speakers on the side of it that kind of lock in with magnets and they charge at that time. And you can pull them off and then you can put them in the back of the room and the batteries last for about eight or 10 hours and it also comes with a wireless subwoofer. But now you have a, a little surround sound system without running wires. Um, I will say these, these kinds of sound bars that offer the wireless rears usually run off of Bluetooth technology. Now, again, we're in my family room here. My family room is about 18 by 22 and in doing a review or a test for uh, one of the uh, products with the wireless rears like that, uh, it started to kind of reach that range, that, that far range of Bluetooth where it was starting to hear it cut in and out. So you have to keep that in mind if you're working with a soundbar that has wireless rears and it's using Bluetooth communication, watch your distance, you could experience an issue there. Um, then you have soundbars that have all that built into kind of one section. Yamaha does what's called a sound projector and these work really well. Uh, you put them up in the front of the room and they use tons of speakers to beam the sound out into your room and bounce things off the wall and give you kind of this effect of surround sound. So that's another uh, kind of soundbar that exists that um, does a really good job. I love the sound projectors. That's pretty impressive when you're looking at a soundbar in front of you but you're hearing things you know, at the side of your head at your listening position and you know that there's nothing back there. So that's a really, really neat product. Um, so those are those kinds of soundbars. So we covered the soundbars that are just stereo. We covered some surround sound soundbars. 
Now, there's a third kind of category out there of sound bars that are made by wireless audio companies. So I see we have some more people that kind of just joined in the last couple minutes here. So again, right now we're talking about surround sound options for your TV. Um, I already discussed kind of TV settings, and I see we're having some questions pop in, so I'll go back and, and see if there's any questions surrounding TVs. Uh, but right now we're talking about um, surround sound options for your TV. So I covered regular sound, sound bars and surround sound bars. Now, we're gonna talk about companies that do not only wireless um, audio around your house, but it's also a wireless surround sound system too. And there's three big companies out there that do this. Um, you have Sonos, you have Kios, and you have Blue Sound. So all three of these companies have a sound bar that they sell that you can connect to your TV. Then you get a, uh, a wireless subwoofer, and then you can buy two of their speakers, and they go in the back of the room as wireless surrounds. Um, these are better because instead of, if you remember I talked about the surround sound sound bars that use Bluetooth for the weird communication, these are going to use your Wi-Fi as your communication to get the sound from the front of the room to the back of the room. And Wi-Fi is much more stable, it can go further, and you can also send more information on it. So in most cases, using a Wi-Fi enabled surround system is going to be way more reliable too. So these three companies, they sell that product and it does great for surround sound, but where they really kind of take that next step is that you can create a wireless audio system around your house with these products. So you could put a, like it's like a, I don't know if you want to think of like, oh, some of them make them like a shoebox size, okay? And that's a pretty good wireless speaker. And then they have some speakers that are, I don't know, maybe like an old big Foster's can or, you know, uh, uh, a couple of Red Bull cans, something like that size speaker that you can plug in, put in your kitchen. And they have an app that controls them. And when you open up the app, you'll see all those areas of music. So you'll see your family room, you'll see your kitchen, if you put it in the master bedroom. And now you can have wireless audio across the house. And they don't even stop there. They even go further with products. Let's say you wired your house for speakers in the ceiling all throughout the house. You have amplifiers that you can buy to connect to those speakers. Um, or if you have a, a really good like audio for our grade outboard multi-channel amplifier, they make a little product that you can connect to that amplifier. And then it powers those speakers around there too. So lots of different ways to connect these things. Um, between the three, depending on your needs, I mean, they all do something very, very good. Um, personally, at my house, I use Blue Sound. Um, I'm an, you know, more of an audiophile experience that I'm looking for, so Blue Sound offers me that. Heos and also Sonos have their pros and cons. It just, when I meet a client, it really depends on their needs when I talk to them and how they intend to use their system. They're all good at something, and they're all better suited for some people versus others. So. I think right now I'm gonna stop and I wanna take a look at some of these questions right here that Amanda kinda of sent to me. So let me go and grab my iPad here. Let's see. Bob Ryan, can you talk about subwoofer settings and placement? Sure, Bob. So let's start with that. Um, subwoofers in a room, the more the better. <laughs> That's the first thing you wanna consider. Um, I like putting subwoofers up in the front of the room because when you put a subwoofer in the front of the room, let's say you're watching a big time action movie, okay? and you're watching and you see an explosion happen on the screen. And when you see that explosion happen on the screen, if you really want to be immersed in the movie, you want to trick your brain to thinking that you're part of this movie. If I saw an explosion happening in front of me, I mean, first I'd run, but second, you would hear that explosion in front of you as well. So it makes a lot of sense to your brain that when you see the explosion happen in front of you on the screen, that you also feel and hear it come from front of you. Now, you, more the better I talked about because subwoofer, sound in a room can be very hot and cold, okay? In some areas of the room when you sit down you'll have a lot of bass, other areas you won't have any at all. So adding a second subwoofer to your system will help even out that bass response in the room for you and give you way better coverage. Now this can be really hard to do with some of the soundbar based systems because they don't allow for that and that's where a separate wired system would come in handy. As far as settings are concerned, usually they have two of them on there that are very important. You have your low pass crossover setting and your gain adjustment. And that's telling your subwoofer how much, how much of the audio spectrum do you want that subwoofer to play? How much music do you want to play? The higher you raise the number, usually it goes from about 50 to 120. I usually start at that 80 mark and then kind of work it back a little bit because the higher up you put that number, the subwoofer is going to be boomier and definitely louder, but it's going to be muddier and not as accurate. So I like to bring it down and then bring the gain up. Always start with the gain at about 12 o'clock 
And uh, again, it's really how it reacts in your room, but those are some basic guidelines, so I hope that was helpful. All right, let me do something here. Again, we're adjusting and playing around. Background music is a little too loud, so we're gonna turn that down. Weldon Brown, can you address the dimming of LG OLED TVs? The dimming, Weldon Brown, the dimming. I'm trying to think, the dimming. Well, I know OLED TVs can have uh, like an eco mode set on them, and that comes from out of the box. That's another setting that can sometimes be on. Um, so that's a, if you go into the LG's menu and look for eco mode and shut that down, that can produce a much brighter image. So I think that's what Walden's talking about here. If I'm not, please clarify. But that that is something that's a default setting in an OG L, an, an LG OLED. So you want to turn that off to get a much brighter image out of those. Uh, Adam Ned, just purchased a Pioneer receiver from you. It has two Sabre DACs. Question is, should I bypass the DAC on a UDP LX500 player, which has excellent analog AKM DACs by using the digital optical out? Not sure which is better for two channel audio. Okay. I would, let's see the 40, I'm looking at those two DACs, the Pro DAC versus the AKM, the EQ, the one that's in there. Whew. You gotta listen to it first and foremost. I would hook it up both ways and try. Um, I mean, the specs would, would lead me to tell you that the AKM would be the better way to go for two channel playback, um, but you never know. You know, you hook it up both ways and, and see what see what happens. Um, my gut would tell me that using the analog out of the, of the universal player, that DAC seems to be better, um, but I would try both. Okay, and Robert Smith, do you offer professional ISF calibration? Uh, at the moment, we don't have the, the tool set currently at Worldwide to do the ISF calibration. We have, we're very good at setting TVs up, um, but we don't have the equipment yet to do the ISF. That is definitely something we are looking into. All right, so that's all the questions that I have for now. Uh, we can get back into, those of you who just joined me, we were talking about surround sound, wireless surround sound systems, and then I was going to get into now wired systems for your TV. Um, but first I want to talk about Atmos. What is Atmos? Atmos is a new surround sound format that uh, allows sound to not only move front, back, left, right, but up and down now. Um, so that's really cool. I, I like to give the, uh, the example, if you're, if you're walking through a forest and you hear a bird chirp, okay, and you look up, that directionality of sound is what Atmos is really all about. Um, so it's really cool that we can do that now in, in our home theater systems. My family room here, I have a 7.1.4. Uh, so let me explain those numbers real quick. Seven is the amount of speakers that you have around your room. So I have three speakers in the front, two speakers on the side of me, and then two speakers behind me. That's my seven. Um, and then dot one is my woofer. I need another one. I know, I'm working on it. I'm working on it, all right? But um, then the four is the Atmos speakers that are in my ceiling. And when you place those speakers in the ceiling, the recommendation is that they're about 35 to 55 degrees from your listening position in front and then also behind you. Um, and I have, again, I have two of them and they're in line with where my front speakers are as far as their placement uh, to the front speakers. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Now, this room I had the uh, beauty of building, so I was able to wire it for that. Uh, but what if you don't have that? You know, what if you have a drywalled ceiling that you really don't want to get into because it could be a lot of repair work? There's some great options out there. So from the soundbar category, we have some soundbars out there that offer Atmos. All right, the two that come to my mind are one from Sennheiser called the Ambio, and uh, if you don't already, are on our YouTube channel, Worldwide Stereo on YouTube. I did a product review there. I do a lot of them there, but one specifically on this one that I'm talking about, the Ambio soundbar, has 13 speakers in it. Two of those are actually on top of the soundbar, and they're meant to project up into the room so that they hit the ceiling and then come back down to you in that listening position and give you the sense of having Atmos speakers in your ceiling, even though they're not really there. And this kind of stuff really works. I'd say the soundbar solution is really good at it, at getting that sound up into the up into the ceiling and then bouncing it back down to you and giving you that sense of having surround sound. The Ambio soundbar will require your own separate powered subwoofer. It doesn't come with one, but you can always add that to it, which I would highly recommend. 
Uh, the next one I can think of is from uh, Yamaha, the YSP5600. This has the same type of thing. It has 42 smaller little speakers in it, but that projects sound up into your room and gives you that elevation of, of having sound or Atmos enabled surround sound. Um, so the other uh, review that I did that you want to check out on uh, Worldwide Stereo's YouTube page is from a company, Focal. Uh, Focal has a new speaker out, the 8260D, Cora 8260D, and that has what we'll call Atmos toppers in it. So let's say you built your room five, six years ago, Atmos wasn't really out, and you have a seven channel system, a five channel system, and now that Atmos is out, you really want to add it to it. Well. So there's a category out there called Atmos toppers. And these are little speakers that are angled, again, so that that sound angles up into the room. And they're meant to go right on top of your speaker. A step further than that is like Focal and also Klipsch did this. They put the speaker and you can buy it with it already installed into the speaker, the Atmos topper. Um, on the back of the speaker, you'll then have two hookups, one for the main left or right hookup and the other one on top of that for the Atmos hookup. And this really works. In my, in my review, when I hooked it up at the showroom to test it out, I just hooked up the Atmos channel because I wanted to see how well that sound threw up to the ceiling. And it freaked me out. It was like sound was dancing on the ceiling. Anywhere I went in the room, I just heard all of the music and the vocals coming from the ceiling. It was insane. So this is, I think, a better option than the soundbar options, but of course you would have had a wired system to make it go. But those are two really good options of adding surround sound into your, excuse me, adding Atmos surround sound into your room without running wires and cutting them into the ceiling. So that was really, really cool. Um, I enjoyed that. My review, again, is on, on, uh, on YouTube for that. Please check that out and also like our page. All right, so I see some people coming in, coming out right now. So, so far, we have covered out-of-the-box TV settings, uh, talked about motion flow, uh, I started talking about all your different kinds of surround sound options that you have, whether it's a traditional sound bar, a uh, sound bar with wireless rears. Um, we talked about the Wi-Fi enabled sound, uh, surround sound bar systems with wireless music around the house. And I just finished up with Atmos. So I'm going to take a look at my questions over here and let's see what we have. All right, Michael Bauer, what speakers are those to your right and behind you? Well, thank you for noticing, Michael. Um, these are speakers, actually, that my father built. My father's been building speakers for an incredibly long time. He's very good at it. Um, and these are, so they're, they're, they're homemade and um, they're fantastic. So these are drivers that you can purchase and these are uh, tweeters that are in here. And um, all the crossovers were designed and built. It's all wired up with some Kimber cable on the inside. Um, really fantastic uh, and I really enjoy them. So thanks, Dad, great speakers. All right, Stephen Keeley, are you able to wirelessly install Atmos to an existing wired surround sound system? Let's see, wirelessly install it. Well, so you'd need a powered speaker. If you're gonna wirelessly send information, you would need a powered speaker um, to send that information to. So unfortunately, no, there's really no way of doing that. If you have a wired system, your best bet is to go to get into those Atmos toppers uh, from Klipsch, SVS makes them, uh, and you can put them right on the top of your speakers, your current, your current speakers, and have them come in. Also, another option from, uh, from SVS, the Elevation speakers, it's a speaker that you could actually mount like on your front wall, where your ceiling meets your front wall, okay? You can mount it in this space, and it would fire down into the room. That can be effective too. Not as good as I think as projecting up and bouncing off the ceiling, but you know, depending on what you have going on in, in your room, you know, sometimes we have physical limitations of the room to be able to do it. So um, if you can, put it on top of the speaker and have it fire up. Um, but if you can't, you know, where, that, where your wall meets your ceiling, if you put it in that corner and have it fire down into the room, that could be very effective as well. All right, from Steve, what Atmos speakers on top of your main on top of your main and hitting the ceiling to reflect down. Is there any time delay because of the indirect path? Well, your, your receiver's calibration software would certainly help out with that in terms of getting a delay right. You have channel settings to make sure that things arrive at the same time. Um, but no, I haven't noticed any, any timing delays between that. It ends up sounding very good and everything kind of gels together well. 
Uh, let's see. John, what are your thoughts on room treatments to help slash correct rooms that are too live, reverberant, etc.? Well, big believer in room treatments. I mean, room, your room can definitely change how things sound and, and your, how your speakers sound in the room. So it's important to address that. Um, certainly with, with things like furniture. So again, I just built this room. I have a little bit of a live room going on. So I'm looking into room treatments. Uh, we sell things from a company called Vicoustics um, that make room treatments that are also decorative. Because that's the one thing about room treatments. And sometimes they just... That you don't want your room to end up looking like a studio um, so there's diffusers and sound absorbers um, diffusers are good in like the middle in between your two spaces here to make sure you kind of really break up the sound behind the speakers you would like a lot of absorption if you want to if you're having a problem with bass in the room but as far as the liveliness of the room i would certainly inspect the corners and the back walls and you really need to slow the sound down Anything that you can do to help absorb the sound is going to be great. Thicker carpeting. Um, I was on a call with the uh, Daily Hi-Fi guys. A shout out to them. They were fantastic the other night. We had a great time. Um, but one guy suggested, and I never thought of this, he has a shag carpet, but underneath the carpet he has two levels of padding. And he said that that made a big difference too. So any soft material, anything you can do to help soak up the sound is going to be helpful in controlling how lively the room is. Great question, John. Thanks. Okay, so now let's move on to some of the benefits of a wired surround sound system. I've talked about sound bars, I've talked about wireless sound bars, and ones that have wireless rears. Um, I have a traditional wired system, and the beauty of that is certainly that it's a lot more flexible. It has a lot more inputs. Um, my receiver that I use has seven HDMI inputs that are all capable of 4K. I can hook up a lot of sources to it. Um, the speakers, again, you can hook more speakers up. You have more flexibility with, with that. Adding a second subwoofer, like I mentioned before, isn't really an option. Um, so, you know, it certainly, it's way more flexible. You can do a lot more with the system, having a traditional wired system. And ultimately, the sound quality is going to be your best this way. Um, when you, you know, with all this wireless technology and things like that that we have going on out there, there's still no replacement for taking a speaker and wiring it to an amplifier and for, for listening purposes. And your, your receivers that are out there have a lot of technology in them uh, for doing the streaming services. So I mentioned before like the wireless uh, audio systems that are out there. There's some companies that actually partner with receivers and that's where getting to know the client better and what their needs are is gonna be, is gonna help me design a system for them. So for instance, I mentioned I use Bluesound. So Blue Sound is also partnered or is with NAD. So if you buy a new NAD surround sound receiver, you're going to get the Blue Sound software built into that unit, which is fantastic. You know, Blue Sound is the audiophile version, in my opinion, of doing audio around your home. And it allows for some of the highest resolution audio that we can stream out there inside of their software. Um, so that's certainly a real big differentiator between um, Blue Sound and some of the other products. Having them partner with NAD is fantastic. They make great amplifiers, so that's a good option there. Um, Heos, the Heos software is with Denon and Marantz. So if you buy a Denon or a Marantz receiver, you're gonna get Heos embedded in. And this is great, because now you can have, again, with NAD or Denon and Heos, or Denon and Marantz, you can have a wired system, and you can have wireless audio throughout the house. So it allows me to set up a client with a single app to control all the music in their house. And this wasn't possible a few years ago. A few years ago it was like a two-step tango to get music to play in your room and then also in the other areas of the house. Now I just simply open up the Heos app or the Blue Sound app and I say, oh, family room surround system. I want to play this and then I also want to group it to the kitchen, the patio, um, and the front yard. And it's done. And it's all time aligned perfectly and everything sounds great and I can control the volume independently um, of each area. And once I set it, so I like the family room at this level and I like the patio at this level, the master volume will now raise those up and down together in that ratio. So it makes it super simple to use. Um, also Yamaha. Yamaha gets into that too. I forgot to mention them earlier. My apologies Yamaha. I love Yamaha. Um, they do music cast. So they have that built into their receiver and they make the separate products out there to connect, you know, the little speakers and wireless rears and stuff like that. So they, they get into all that as well. So just another company to give you one steady stream of music um, around the house. Um, so it's another way of uh, another way of doing it. Now the uh, apps that we have for all these things 
all these receivers and most of all these surround systems have apps to control them. Um, a lot of them are also going to be uh, Alexa and Google, you know, smart home integration, allow for all those kinds of things. So if you're into that, you can use your voice to turn things on. I know Bob uses Alexa at home a lot. Uh, I have Google Home here. They're all great. Uh, they all work really, really well. Um, take a pause here. I think I got some questions that came across here. Take a peek. Let's see. Thank you, Amanda, for doing this. Again, my support team at Worldwide Stereo is fantastic. You guys are great. Thank you. Randy, what other Sonos speakers would go with two Play 5 speakers in a master bedroom? Would go with. All right, Randy. Well, you can, you can pair a Sonos subwoofer with those two Play 5s. And I guess it would also depend if you paired them as stereo pairs. Okay, so if you have two Play 5s, you can tell the Sonos software, do I want those to be independent, you know, speaker one and speaker two, and then you can group them together to play the same thing. Or you can actually tell the software, hey, I want this Play 5 to be a left speaker, and I want this Play 5 to be a right speaker, all right? And then they play as a traditional stereo pair of speakers would. Um, if you did the stereo pairing like that, you would be able to put a subwoofer on top of that. Um, you could also move them to the rear or the back of maybe like your bed or your room and add a uh, play bar or Sonos beam and use these play fives as rears too. So that's about the limitation of what you could do with those play fives in a, in a master bedroom. Keith asks, with a wired system, is it better to have multiple amps to power the speakers or a single receiver? Well, it's always better to have more amplification. You know, there's, there's always a good thing of having more horsepower. And it's not because, not usually because, people don't buy big amplifiers because they're looking for more volume. Um, that's a natural byproduct of having more power. Yes, you can turn it up louder. But the main reason is it because it makes things sound better. If you have a lot of horsepower, if you have a lot of amp or wattage in that receiver, or amplifier, I should say the amplifier, playing that at the same volume. So if I hooked up a pair of speakers to a 100 watt per channel receiver, and then I hooked up the same pair of speakers to uh, a system that had a, let's say, 300 watt per channel amplifier on it, and I played them at the same volume, the system that has the 300 watt amplifier on it is going to sound more relaxed, more musical, okay, better detail. The bass is going to be way more accurate because bass requires the most amount of power to really, really hit that and get it going good. You need a lot of power to make that happen. So your bass response is going to be much more accurate and tight and clean and smooth. So having that bigger amplifier is better. So absolutely, Keith, if you can do it, get amplifiers. Get They make three-channel amplifiers. They make five-channel amplifiers, seven-channel amplifiers, uh, two-channel amplifiers. You know, my setup here is I use a two-channel amplifier to power my mains. And then I am using currently the, the rest of the receivers, nine amplifiers to power my center channel and all of my surrounds and my Atmos speakers. So, you know, but when I listen to music, it goes through that amplifier and makes these speakers sing really nice. Good question. Uh, Justin asks, what do you think the difference is from having a native processor with no onboard amp versus using a receiver with its RCA preouts? That's a good one. That's a good one, Jason. I, or Justin. Justin, I'm sorry, Justin. Um, I get that a lot, you know, because the cost of a of an AV preamp is certainly much higher than is a receiver. And the difference really is is that you have an independent power supply, in my opinion, just just powering that the circuitry that's in the AV preamp. And typically, too, it's not just more money. You're getting a much be much better DAC section built into there too. So the separate AV preamps. Um, or AV surround sound preamps always have better circuitry in them too. Um, a lot of that as well as the connectivity will change too. Um, so when you look at an AV preamp versus a receiver, uh, most AV receivers are only going to have RCA style preouts which we call unbalanced connections. When you move into a preamp, most preamps have balanced connections and unbalanced connections which will get you into using you know some great cabling um, from like some from AudioQuest for instance you could take some AudioQuest XLR cables which you call balanced cables and connect them to your amplifier and a balanced cable is much cleaner and quieter than is a standard unbalanced or RCA style connection so that's always a differentiator too depending on the resolution you're trying to achieve or the performance that you want to go for a uh, separate AV preamp is always a better option one for the independent power supply and two you'll get better circuitry and outputs in the balance connection so I would always recommend doing doing the separate connection there 
uh, and using or the separates and using a, a balanced connection. That's better, much better. Good question. Um, so we uh, let's see the video. This video that we're going to do that we're doing. <laughs> excuse me. Um, will be loaded onto our Facebook page later, uh, so you can review it. Uh, if there's any questions that you want to come up with and think of after the fact, you can always send that to us in a uh, in a direct message. Um, and then we're going to respond to them all that way. We'll, they'll get them to me and I can respond to you. Um, just so you know, Worldwide Stereo, we're still running and, and in full effect here. All of the salesmen uh, from the Ardmore and Montgomeryville showroom. I'm from Montgomeryville myself. We are all working at home and we're here to help you. So we can do things. We can do all the service calls and, uh, and help you out. Call your salespeople. Email us. Um, if you have a, if you lost the card or whatever, you can always email us at hello at worldwidestereo.com. And that's on our page and that'll get to us and we can reach out to you and help you uh, I've been doing a lot of you know FaceTiming with my clients if they have any questions in this time of need we're all home we're all with our equipment and technology right now uh, so you know sometimes it needs a little bit of service and we're here to help you uh, so we appreciate that the worldwide stereo online marketplace is wide open and it's been going fantastic thank you everybody for your support there uh, we're doing a ton of business on that and it's it's great to have uh, you know loyal customers and new customers come in and and purchasing things from us again We can get those out to you. So we're all here to help you out um, Let's see here Just got a little note here uh, Yeah If anybody like I said is having technical difficulties, please reach out to us and we're available for remote support as well uh, Again, like I was talking about only the salesman I can I can FaceTime you, we can call you, a lot of problems we can fix over the phone to, to give you a hand. Um, so, yeah, and this was our first Facebook Live video. Uh, I hope it was uh, informative. If you have any follow-up questions, please send that through direct message. This video will be available again. We're going to put it back on our page. Uh, so, again, any follow-up questions, let us know. We're glad to help you. I want to thank everybody so much for watching. I had a lot of fun doing this. Hopefully, we're going to do some more. I think that's in the pipeline, so stay tuned for that. Um, Let's see are there any more questions right now before I before I uh, we take off here anything that anybody wants to talk about um, uh, any like I said I'll take any questions anybody has right now whoops let me see here let's see if another one came across no Steven you're welcome what are your favorite Tony, what are your favorite Bluetooth? Whoop, I missed that. Went so fast on the screen here. Thanks, John. Outdoor speakers, Justin. Sure, we can talk. We're gonna actually do, that's a, a great uh, lead into our what our next video is gonna be. We are gonna talk about outdoor um, entertainment as that's a big thing right now. Um, and, uh, but there are, I mean, tons of different outdoor systems. There's traditional speakers that you put on the house. There's rock speakers, and, and we have the satellite subsystems. Um, so we are going to do a whole video on outdoor entertainment. And all that wireless technology I talked about in terms of getting music around the house, you can absolutely add that to it. We not only do outdoor audio, but we do outdoor lighting as well. Uh, that's one of my favorite categories. Have you ever seen a house lit up at night uh, with the proper up lighting? It, the curb appeal is just to die for. Uh, so that's something we do as well. Let's see, any word on the Focal 806s? Not yet, Dan. Dan asks, any word who won the Focal 806s? I will check with the marketing team for you and see if uh, see if that uh, see if we have a winner out there. I didn't know about that. What what is a good sound bar medium range other than the Yamaha 209? That's a tough one. That Yamaha 209 is certainly a beast. Um, for the money, it, it sounds fantastic. Um, whew. I don't know. I'd buy the Yamaha. <laughs> I'll be honest. I'd just buy the Yamaha. That's a great product. Hey, if you're, you're king of the hill, just grab it. Uh, let's see. Thanks for the feedback. I'd like to know when we plan our next live video. Uh, how long in advance do you, would you want to know? Oh, that's us responding. Oh, gotcha. Whew. I haven't listened to a lot of vinyl lately. It's been great working from home. I'm playing records constantly. It's much, much better. Uh, I love, I love vinyl. I'm a two channel guy at heart. 
What are your favorite Bluetooth noise canceling headphones? My favorite. I have a couple actually. Um, so I had the Bose QC35s, uh, which I use a lot actually. Uh, if you saw my podcast, I was using them then. Um, I also love the Sony's, the new Sony, uh, the 1000XM. They have uh, both an in ear and an over the ear version of them. Uh, the comfort on both of those is fantastic. I think Sony, because it's newer, the QC35 is a little bit older. Uh, the Sony versions are more comfortable and the noise canceling is actually more automatic. It's like a, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? It's like a smart headphone. That's the word I was looking for. Because uh, it can tell it when it needs more noise cancellation or not. So the Sony's I think are fantastic and the Bose is, is really good as well. Sorry, I may have missed this recommendation for Atmos in-ceiling speakers. Uh, and who's that from? I'm sorry. Brent. Brent. There he goes. All right, Brent. So I would say it depends on the rest of your system. When you have the ability to, you really want to match up the brand of your speaker across the board. Um, your front three are the most important though. Okay, so the front three speakers need to match because when you're watching a movie um, or a show, at any time the human dialogue could come out of any one of those three speakers. So if you have speakers that aren't matched tonally, that same person is gonna sound different in those speakers and that's another way to throw your brain off. I mean, it's really important to Get, get a sound that, 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 that suspends your disbelief and, and makes you feel like you're actually in the movie. And any little thing like that can trip you up. So um, I would say try and match it to whatever the rest of your speakers are. Um, I personally love Focal. I have Focal in ceiling speakers uh, right now for my Atmos. And I use the version, that's what's called the LCR, because the speakers are angled a little bit inside. So if you're looking at it from the side, they're, they're angled, which really helps get that sound down into my listening position. Um, so it was very helpful but I've done lots of systems with the, uh, like a six inch or an eight inch circular in ceiling speaker. They sound great too, um, but if you can do it, these it's a, it's a square version and the speakers are angled and that helps really project the sound down. That's what I would recommend doing. Uh, Wheeze, are universal Blu-ray players available in the US that play PAL discs in addition to region one discs? Unfortunately, not that I'm aware of, no. Um, you know, the region setting is set for a reason, um, so it's hard to find a player that will do both. I'm sure they exist out there, but not from your, your everyday general, you know, Pioneer, Sony manufacturers. That's uh, not going to be out there. Uh, I sweepstakes. Oh, okay. We'll hang on a little bit longer. If anybody else has any further questions for me, I'd love to help you out and take them. Um, great job. Jamie, thank you. Hey, this is my first one. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I really want to do more of these, you know. Uh, so any, any suggestions, like I said, that you have, please, anybody out there, send us a direct message and uh, let us know um, what you'd like us to talk about um, and cover any demonstrations you want us to do or specific products possibly that, uh, that you want us to review because we're all working from home and uh, it's, it's great we have that, have that time to do it. So let's, uh, let's make more of this happen and maybe we can continue doing it in the future too and we get back, uh, get back to regular uh, daily operation. You're welcome, Anthony. I love the little thumb up things that go on the screen. That's fantastic. Thank you guys. Love it. Love it. Oh, here we go. Jamie says, I have a question about projectors. Do you have any preference on what color screen to get for bright rooms? Well, there are specific screens. That's a good question, Jamie. There are specific screens that are manufactured for bright rooms, and it's called an ALR screen. It's an ambient light rejection screen. Most of them are going to be silver in nature. Um, so you're probably referring to, you know, there are white screens and there are silver screens. And the silver ones technically or usually have higher gains associated with them, um, which is better for a bright room. And then one step further is that there's these ambient light rejection screens that exist out there. Um, so that is really helpful for a room where you have a projector in it that's going to have a bright screen. So, uh, Stewart Film Screen makes a product called the Phantom Screen. Um, and this is about the best one that I've seen out there. I mean, no surprise that it's from Stuart Film Screen. If you're not aware, Stuart Film Screen is really the only company that makes a screen from scratch. 
your other manufacturers out there, although they're good and the screens look, you know, they're, they're kind of nice. Uh, when you compare that to a Stuart film screen, it's the uniformity of the image across the screen is just perfect. Um, so that's because Stuart builds their screen from scratch. And the Phantom screen is awesome because they not only took into consideration having ambient light rejection, but what happens when you want to watch it at night? You know, you're going to want to watch this thing at night as well. And a lot of the ambient light rejection screens that are out there, when you watch them at night, tend to have a big, big bloom in the middle of them because they have so much gain to them. Um, so in that instance, you probably want to really make sure you have a couple different preset video settings in your projector to, to make it look better. Um, but if the main purpose is watching it, uh, you know, during the day, something like today, an ambient light rejection screen is great. But if you want to have dual purpose or just, in my opinion, simply the best screen, get the Stuart Film Screen Phantom Screen. And uh, you can direct message us if you'd like, if you want to give us an idea of what you're looking for, and we can uh, get you a price on that. <laughs> Louise or Louis Louise, how about a demo of those new giant Macintosh amps? <laughs> I would love to have those here. I definitely did the unboxing, um, and uh, if Bob will let me get them here, sure, we could have a demo them here. That would be fantastic. They are awesome. I don't know if you ever, everybody saw that video. It's uh, the MC901 from Macintosh. It's uh, a new hybrid amplifier, so it has a 300 watt tube amplifier on it and a 600 watt solid state amplifier on it. So this is this is your ampl an amplifier dream. This is the best amplifier, in my opinion, you could ever buy because when you, you can buy amp your speakers, you put the tube to the mids and the highs, making them sound silky smooth and sweet. And then you put the solid state to the lows and the woofers to give that a lot of power and, 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 and control of the woofer. It's the perfect amplifier. So I'd love to be able to do that. Oh, question. I wanted to know, so we have a little bit of our uh, background music that we use for our YouTube videos on. Is that distracting? Good. I think earlier somebody said it was a little too loud, so I turned it down. Uh, do you like it? Do you not? Let me know. Mario. Hey, Mario. Thanks. I'll see you. A lot of good questions. You guys are awesome. Thank you. A lot of good questions. Uh, check out our... Oh, there's the unboxing video. Yep. The guys just put that link up there for you, the unboxing video, it looks like. else we got can you call out yeah they're coming soon yeah I guess with that the MC901 we were gonna do a review soon um, hey they are 180 pounds a piece so um, they're currently set up we got a new rack of equipment we actually posted that that we did the new um, setup in our in our signature audio room we got a new audio rack and everything set up differently I had the uh, audio quest cables um, retooled that we use there um, to support a bi amp hookup. Um, those are the Thunderbirds. We, we did a lot of audio quest upgrades actually around the, around the store. All of our speaker wire now has been upgraded because they have a whole new design. Um, I, they're, they're awesome. Uh, they sound great. Um, definitely a big improvement from the, the line that they had before. Uh, so you should, when we get back and run, we can check those out. Weldon. Oh wait, whoops, I'm sorry, one. Kyle, I purchased some used RF82, left LCR. What surrounds would you recommend to match them with and what kind of stands that are child-friendly if they are bumped into? Ooh, that's a tough one. Stands that are child-friendly. Uh, not too many It's <laughs> the right answer. Uh, unfortunately, there's there aren't many stands that, unless you're buying the bookshelf speaker from the manufacturer, and that manufacturer man makes their own stand, that's when you'll see that they'll typically have a screw on the bottom of them to screw in the bottom of the speaker and help secure it down to the stand. Um, when you're buying surrounds, the ones from Klipsch that I would go with um, are like the 240s or the 250s. It's like a dipole, bipole um, speaker for a surround. Um, and you'll have, uh, so the speaker wait, yeah, comes at you like this. And here and here will be a tweeter woofer and then on the other side it'll be a tweeter woofer here so the tweeters and woofers are in different areas they work really well for surrounds they're on our page worldwidestereo.com we could ship those to you um, but that would pair well with with your rf uh, 82s that you have there <laughs> tori just said hi to everybody i'm sorry i have a toddler hi tori there she comes <laughs> 
Um, we are working from home. <laughs> I have toddlers and teenagers. Uh, Weldon Brown says, can you go over again the combo of a two-channel amp and a surround receiver? Thanks. Sure, be happy to, Weldon. Uh, so my setup at home, uh, I have a RXA 3080 Yamaha, and then I have a, a two-channel half-flare amplifier that I'm using to power my fronts. So what I've done is I've taken the RCA outputs of the of the ampl of the receiver for the front left and right, and that goes to the amplifier. The speakers wired directly to the amp, and then all of my other speakers, the center, the side surrounds, the rear surrounds, and the four Atmos speakers are getting powered from the Yamaha RXA 3080. Um, and that's not, uh, you're not able to do that with every receiver and not every receiver, because you have to go into the amplifier configuration menu and tell it that you're trying to do that. Um, so not everybody allows you to bypass the front amplifier and repurpose that somewhere else. So that was kind of cool that Yamaha allowed for that, um, which allowed me to use the nine amplifiers on board for the rest. Um, there's an amplifier I got my eye on uh, from Audio Control. If you're not familiar with Audio Control, they're based out of Seattle, and they make this amp called the Avalon G4. And it's a really versatile amplifier because you can use it in a four, three, or two channel configuration. Um, it comes in just under 2,000 bucks, and it's, uh, it's pretty special. I think it sounds really good. Um, so I think that would might be my next thing for me. But that's how you put together a separate amplifier with a receiver. It's all in the amplifier configuration settings of your particular receiver, um, but be careful because not every receiver is going to have that flexibility of repurposing the front amplified channels to use somewhere else. Uh, so if that's what you're trying to do, you may lose two channels of amplification if you can't do that, okay? Justin asks, do you guys sell commercial cinema speakers? That's what I use. Uh, yes, so B&W uh, has a whole kind of commercial style line of uh, custom theater speakers. They're called also Klipsch has their THX uh, cinema system. Um, again, these are more commercial based or like, I mean, people, we put them in people's homes all the time, but that's kind of the level that they're at. So yes, Bowers and Wilkins has some and also Klipsch does. So if that answers your question, Justin. <laughs> People said hi to Tori. Thank you. <laughs> Oop, that's the jingle on my dog's collar there. If you heard that. Got a yellow lab. Her name is Leia. All right. Any more questions at all before we head out here? I'm happy to hang around as long as you guys you guys got some questions for me. I'm happy to happy to help you out. Again, don't forget that we can give you a hand if you're having any problems at your house. Give us a call. We have remote service available. Uh, reach out to your salespeople. Uh, let us know how we can help you in any way. All right. Well, again, I want to thank everybody for joining in. This has been a truly fun time. Uh, remember, you know, you can go to WorldwideStereo.com. There's a lot of stuff we can uh, we can still sell you. And we can ship it to you. Uh, when we'll be on again? We're going to be on again as soon as we can, and we will certainly send that out there. Um, but in the meantime, if you have any questions, you can call us, email us, talk to your salespeople. We can help you. We can sell you things, ship it to your house, um, do remote service for you, all that kind of stuff. Anything we sell online, we have a 60-day return policy. It's free shipping, and we're certainly authorized dealers for everything that we sell here. So, uh, oh, wait, anything coming through? So, whoa. I got two, la two more questions right here, so let me answer this before we go. Michael, I have a ground loop problem in my home theater. Currently, I'm using RCA interconnects. Would switching to balance cables solve the problem? Uh, ground loop problem? No, not necessarily. Now, I'm going to give you a tip here, and you're going to think I'm crazy, but it works. And it's usually the cause of most ground loop problems. If you're... If your cable box is near this system, or a cable box is wired into this system, do me a favor, go behind your cable box and unscrew the coax wire that is connected to your cable box. That, you know, that's the wire that makes your cable box work. You may notice that the hum will go away. Uh, most cable systems in people's homes, they're not properly grounded and a ground hum is usually caused by a cable box or the coax wire coming into that. Um, they do 
have um, uh, what's called a ground loop isolator for a coax line. If that works, okay, and you notice that the ground or the hum goes away when you unscrew that, that coax line, all you need is a ground loop isolator for your coax line and you'll be fine. That's the cause of most problems. So, uh, Nick, no, no, Nick, I'm sorry, Michael, Michael, give that a shot and uh, let us know. Nick says, I have an open backed entertainment center so I can see the wires behind it going to and from the TV. Do you have any recommendations for managing the cables while looking sleek and discreet? Yes, so my cabinet here from Salamander, I have, uh, they sell what's called a lacing bar. And that's a bar that goes on the back of your equipment and just goes across like in between, suspended in between the two shelves. So it helps you route your cabling and then you can come in to your receiver or your amplifier, wherever you need. Um, so that's very handy. So if you're, you can get a lacing bar that's made by the manufacturer for your uh, piece of furniture, um, that's what I would recommend doing. Also, if you don't have that, I would think if you could bundle them together as best as possible, they make colored wire loom. So at least it doesn't look like a bunch of individual wires. It's kind of one, you know, big trunk. That'll, that'll look a little bit better if you can't get the lacing bars. Justin asks, adding two or more subwoofers in setting and setting independent delay. Adding two or more subwoofers and setting independent delay. Oh, okay. So phasing control of subwoofer is very important to mess around with. Um, and basically you want to set your subwoofer up in the room and on the back of the control of the subwoofer there should be a phase dial. And you'll need some help with this because you want to sit in your listening position and you want to turn that dial until it's the loudest. That's the best way to do it. Then you know that you're in phase basically with your room. You know, you're not getting any cancellations from that. So, um, but doing two together after that, I would do them independently. Um, I would do the phasing control independently because they're in different locations. And if they're both the loudest where your listening position is at, you should be in line with each other. Brian, do you sell mini DSP HD? Not yet. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, we do not. Brian. I mean, a lot of the, Brian, a lot of the, Brian, a lot of the products that we deal with have their own um, calibration software built into it. And some of the newest one out there is a system called Dirac, uh, which we're loving, actually. Um, so you're able to, you know, tailor your speakers to your room and take into consideration things like phasing. That's where Dirac really separates itself. So that's generally what we use for most of our setups. All right, so I'm being told we are out of time for now. Again, one more time, thank you so much uh, for everybody joining. Um, I love all your questions. If there are any follow-up questions, like I said, you can take those. We'll go back and go through our comments and we'll answer any questions that come through after the fact. Direct message us for anything that you might want to see us do in the future or any follow-up questions to this video because we will be posting this video um, in HD on our Facebook channel. Um, go to WorldWideStereo.com. Again, we can ship you anything that you'd like. Reach out to your salespeople uh, or us directly for any remote service needs. We're, we're, we're happy to help you out and give you a hand with anything. Again, on, online we have the 60-day return policy. We're authorized dealers for everything that we sell here. Um, and. Uh, you know, we offer free shipping on that too. So thank you again. This is Adam with Worldwide Stereo reminding you to listen to music every single day. So long.